Okay, welcome to the Alta Expo. This is Alta Expo number nine at Porkfest 2011. And uh, it's Saturday, I think. Well, we've got a segment here on uh, Fab Labs, Hacker Spaces, and Community Workshops. Um, I just, I know for myself uh, that I, I wanted a place to to work on my projects and I needed all these various different tools and I didn't have them all and I couldn't afford them all. And what a hacker space is, is a place where guys get together, pool their, their money for the rent and for the tools and uh, work on the projects they've always wanted to work on together. So we've got four guys here that are associated with various different hacker spaces. Now, uh, in my lack of sleep, <laughs> I'm going to try to remember everybody's name, get it right. <coughs> Garrett Fox, right? No. Stephen no. Prince, Christian St. Cyr, and Zach Fix. And I'll let them take it from here, tell you about what they're doing in their hacker spaces. I'd really like to hear more about your hacker spaces. <laughs> well, who started? Go ahead. Okay, well, I'm, not, I'm a noob. I just got into this stuff very, very recently. I uh, started messing around with uh, the rep rap. I actually wanted to bring one. Um, didn't make it up there. There's already a lack of space just from all the gear. But um, I'm just now starting to get into this stuff so that uh, I, I love the idea of hacker spaces because it's supposed to be get together with other people that already have so much more knowledge and have figured this stuff out already. They've been through all the, the troubleshooting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just really exciting to see so many popping up all over the place. There's one down the Baltimore node in Maryland, and then we have another one in D.C. I forget what it's called. Uh, Pack D.C. Oh, okay. that's it. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things about these communities is they're sort of open source community where people share information that accelerates the learning and doing process. So, um, we're trying, we're, we're wanting to start one up in the key. Um, we want to set up a more on the Fab Lab type um, angle of that. Fab Lab was developed out of uh, MIT by Neil Biff. Yep, it's a You got project. Back in the room. Yeah, we can't right. hear you back here. Okay. Um, and the idea was to be able to make pretty much anything with a, with a limited set of tools in a, in a limited amount of space. So um, that technology has been developed to a certain extent where it's now accessible to people like us and people like you um, if we create an environment where we can share those either by through a shared workspace or through a business or through a there's lots of different structures um, as to how we can get access to these types of tools but the, the great thing about it is, is that it, we're now limited to some extent by our creativity rather than by the tools that we have access to and so it's a very disruptive technology in that regard in that um, we're now being able to you know, move production from mass production through and moving that to customization and beyond that to personalization and once you reach personalization it means that we're now using uh, information and converting information basically into physical goods so um, it's an exciting um, possibility that is being made accessible just through the, the normal progression of technology but also through the shared knowledge that happens through the communities which most of the hacker spaces and fab labs do everything open source so if somebody learns something we all learn something yeah. yep and then it's documented on lots of weekly pages <laughs> right right so my name is Christian. Um, I come from southern New Hampshire area. Uh, we have a hacker space called Make It Labs in Nashua, New Hampshire. We're just opening up a new space. We moved from uh, northern Massachusetts in Lowell, Mass to Nashua, New Hampshire. We now have a 6,000 square foot space, uh, which means we get lots of space to do fabrication. Um, we have a car lift. We have a mini mill, a mini lathe. We have drill presses. We have welding equipment. We have lots of space to do dirty messy fabrication we also have a smaller space uh, where we have electronics benches so if you're interested in doing arduinos or leds or any sorts of small electronics 
We have seven workstations with soldering irons, computers, you can hook up your microcontrollers to and everything. Uh, you can program at those stations, you can test electronics at those stations. Uh, we also have an area for giving presentations. We have um, a projector and chairs and computers and all that. Um, how we started was we were in Lowell, Mass. Um, and it was a really small group of mostly electrical engineering students and electrical engineers um, and some mechanical people as well. And basically we've started a space where people can bring in their tools and share ideas and teach each other things that each one doesn't know. So if someone knows how to weld and someone knows how to program a mini computer, they can teach each other those things. Um, we quickly outgrew that space, and which is why we moved up to Nashville, New Hampshire. Uh, so we're opening uh, on July 2nd uh, in this massive space. Uh, we're looking to do classes on welding, on electronics, on anything that the community is, is interested in learning. Um, and, and we're going to go from there. So. I'm uh, Zach Fix from just outside uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, upstate South Carolina. Um, I like to come at the uh, hackerspace, makerspace stuff from uh, an activist standpoint and how it can be used to um, reduce the power and control of not only uh, governments but corporations and how to uh, in bring the tools and skills of activists um, to whether it be in printing shirts or making signs or anything like that without everyone having to own their own equipment and uh, doing it as cheaply as possible. Uh, I work with an organization called uh, Free Agents, uh, FR3 Free Agents, and one of the subsets of that is something called Free Labs. Um, and the goal with Free Labs is to eventually have a space um, or several spaces throughout the country where people can come and uh, learn maker skills that are related to um, um, activism. Again, learn how to screen print, learn how to build a uh, screen printing press, learn how to um, do video stuff, audio stuff, um, and borrow equipment to do it, have access to computers to do it, um, and even almost doing some of it via like a digital virtual hacker space um, through websites like Instructables, where if you don't have access to the space yourself and you can't go to a class there, there's still these well-documented step-by-step uh, processes to be able to build and do that stuff. Um, at this point, you know, we've sort of turned my basement into a space where um, we built a four-color, four-station screen printing press that we found instructions for online. Then we printed up Motorhome Diaries t-shirts. Um, I'd like to see stuff like yeah, I do the fixed brewing stuff, uh, homebrew that we barter for or sell on the uh, at events like this. Um, teach people to do that, or even see combined with a maker space something like a brew on premises, where people can make their own beer or wine without having to invest in all the equipment and have the support of other community members that have been brewing for longer. That's so exciting. I love to hear that so much of this stuff is going on. Right. The egoism thing is, you know, there's also the opportunity to do the inside outside. So you can have the space being inside the system, it pays taxes, right. it has the location, it does all of the, you know, jumps through all the hoops that maybe is necessary to jump through, and you can have dozens of businesses hanging off one space. I mean, literally dozens. Um, so it, en it enables basically click on business. If you, you know, if you add business services, which is one of the things that we're looking at to do in Key, is you know, if you add on all the business services that might be attached to that, like you, know, you have a space where some a place where somebody can deliver, um, you know, shipments of materials, or you can have an account for the for the space where you can buy in the raw materials. That means that all of your members don't need that. Stuff. So you can literally have. Um, dozens of agorists that are working outside the system with one space working inside the system. Uh, a good example of that is not specifically even in our community, 
um, is um, there are a few restaurants um, that work, with, they do delivery, they do night cooking, and they don't have their own restaurant space. They hook up with a restaurant and use their downtime to use their commercial kitchen, so they're not having to own a commercial kitchen. Um, there's, I believe it's a uh, Ethiopian place in um, uh, New York City that does, they're based out of a different kitchen. They're only open four days in a week, but each of those four days, their kitchen is a different kitchen. Um, they're using, um, they go to restaurants that are open six days a week and that one day a week they're closed is where they're based at. And they, you know, everything's delivery, but they don't, they're still an up and up, you know, using all approved commercial stuff without having to own it. And the company that, or the nonprofit that helps organize stuff like that, that's their goal is to help people start businesses without the upfront cost. What's the nonprofit is that? Hmm? What nonprofit is that? I don't remember. <coughs> it was an article read online and then a brief mention in an NPR uh, story. Um, but taking that kind of model <coughs> even further off the books where there's not necessarily a central 501c3 or whatever, it's just, hey, I own a restaurant or I own a screen to print a shop. It can even be stretched to medicine. Because um, there's other, uh, there's dentist offices that work like this. Um, I don't know if it's here in the U.S., but um, where they will use another dental office, um, and you get a cash only, but the real dentist doing dental care in someone else's chair uh, in the off hours. There's always a dentist mm -hmm. So different spaces are run differently. Some spaces are just for people to come meet and just to take classes or learn things or do hobbyist things. There are other spaces that um, really support businesses and having a really dedicated space that's just yours, that's just, just where you run your business out of. Um, there are other spaces that are um, just co-working spaces, so they don't have um, fabrication facilities, they don't have equipment, but they're just there to run, basically have a, a place to hook up your laptop and a phone and, and you know, work, work from there and be able to basically be able to wake up and go to a place where other people are working uh, instead of working in your pajamas at home, you know, you're working around other people. So it, you know, from everything from a space where everyone's going to show up at 7 o'clock after work, <coughs> and and do hobbyist things to you're gonna wake up at nine o'clock and and share resources throughout the whole day. So, just different different spaces are meant for different things. Yeah, uh, that's where I'm coming from. So the maker space in your bedroom when yes. you're sitting there in your pajamas and everything's spread out. I actually kind of like it, but so I need to get down to the the spaces some more. You meet so many cool people that just have so much more information than you get. That you don't have to work through all the trials and tribulations. Right, that's, so that, that's one of the biggest parts of these spaces. Is the equipment is really cool, enables you to do really cool stuff, but the stuff that really gets you, you know, accelerated is that you, know, you don't know how to do all of the things or use all of the equipment, but there's somebody there that does. So if you need one piece of information or you, to use one tool very briefly to complete your project or to make your project possible, You've got other people around you that can make you, get you to get that leap, so that you don't have to spend a week or a month or something learning how to do that. Just that one bit, you can go over to George and say, "If I was to do this, what would I use?" And he'd just tell you in five minutes, and you're and you're good to go. So um, it takes away those barriers to getting the stuff done that you want to get. Done. It's all about doing it, rather than moving from creativity and imagination into getting stuff done that you want to achieve. And the great thing is you're going to add back into that as a resource. So you might need someone to tell you what blade to put on the bandsaw when you're cutting through this piece of metal for your project, but then when they come to you and they need to know how to hook up an LED to a, you know, a chip, that you're going to be able to draw out a little diagram and show them. So you're, you're able to, you know, kind of in a circular way, um, help, help each other and add into the resources of the space. And it's motivating too. You're talking about right. your project with other people, and that gets you excited and you know pushes you on. Right. So somebody can say, "How are you going with your project?" I mean, you know, for the people that have had those ideas sitting in the back of their minds Absolutely. for years and, and right. haven't really just gone and pushed it, that sometimes is all the impetus you need just to get things going. And what we end up seeing is all of a sudden people find our space and they go, "I have six projects that are completely <laughs> unfinished, 
that I've been thinking about doing for six months and I just I don't have the resources or I don't have the knowledge or I don't have whatever and you come into the space and all of a sudden you start banging out project after project and then other people come into the space and they see people finishing things and that's really inspiring like when you see other people actually executing the ideas that they have and the passions that they have about different subjects you get excited and you start finishing things or learning about things and, and, and doing as opposed to just seeing what other people do and online or whatever and getting excited about things and never doing anything you get to come into a space, execute, build things and really get that satisfaction hence the unfinished rip rip yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have one at our space too so okay. don't, don't, don't be careful don't feel too bad, okay explain what a riprap is. So, okay, all right, all right, okay, we'll, we'll go into the 3D printing world. I, I mean, that's really what excites me, is the, the desktop manufacturing. Um, it, you know, if you need, I, I saw this one video of a guy using, uh, to, well, first off, a three-dimensional printer for anyone that hasn't heard of that yet. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically like a hot glue gun machine. This would be perfect time for my pictures, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> But it basically layers up plastic on top of its, um, like, the little hot plate at the bottom. There. Um, layer upon layer, it's like the opposite of a CNC machine. As opposed to, it, like, instead of taking away material, it adds material. And um, the whole idea is for it to self-replicate. So it can print its own parts and... Uh, <laughs> you need a lot of tech. Well, the rep wrap itself is specifically yeah. designed to to replicate itself. I mean, a three D printer in general, there's tons of different forms, are just meant to take something you've designed in the digital world, so in a CAD program, and actually be able to have it printed physically on your desk. If you need a uh, a shower ring clip, <laughs> and you don't have any, you can design them really quickly on your computer, print them out on your desktop and print out five of them and all of a sudden your shower curtain is hung. You know, you, you need a part that's broken on something that you have in your kitchen. Uh, someone repaired their uh, dishwasher. They needed some sort of ring to screw in to hold something. And they designed it, printed it up, and installed it. And they had repaired their device in their house without going to some appliance store and try to figure out what it was. They just did it themselves. Which and is hopefully really, they uploaded. Well, the, here's the other thing. The, yeah. <laughs> so, because all these parts are digital, we can now share them over this beautiful thing called the internet. And you can go to this website called Thingiverse.com or anywhere. Yeah, you just right. want to email it to each other. But there's yeah. a website that's great called Thingiverse. You can go to that website, look up, or just browse through, or try to find what you're doing. If you want a pair of tweezers, if you want, you know, a soap dish, if you want a comb. You can go onto this website, download the digital file, put it into your 3D printer, and in 20 minutes or so, you have something physical. So instead of relying on, you know, a Chinese-made part or uh, or trying to make sure that you that you find specifically what you want, you can just print it out. And the best part is you can change it if you want to. So that this allows you to customize things. If you need something bigger or smaller or a different color or a little bit different to take the different screws that you have in your drawer or something you can do that you can you can edit it you can change it so and from that you can grow it is, yeah, it is. <laughs> and from that you know you can grow um, successful businesses i have a friend who's uh, was he's a machinist and he was uh, pretty hitty, pretty hard in the uh, uh, the economy you know getting his hours cut from 30 hours a week down to 4 and 5 um, but he's a, he's a maker, a hardware hacker, and has a, uh, I forget which one, but a, a 3D printer at home. A neighbor was walking by and saw his solar panels uh, on the roof of his garage workshop and then came to just randomly talk to him. And then he saw his 3D printer. And a few days later he showed up at his house with this, this little part, a little claw looking thing. He was like, is there any way you could make me one or two of these? And he's like, you know, all right, um, I'll see what I can do. And then he printed one up. And about a week and a half later, the, the guy came up and he's like, all right, you know, I work for a pharmaceuticals company. We have a uh, um, um, robot that we use in manufacturing the pills. 
uh, this claw is you know a couple of grand part that we have to order from um, from China or Japan but it takes four to five months when one of these breaks that machine is down until we get the new part if you can do these we'll buy them from you at you know half of what they pay them but that became a big part of his business a big part of his uh, livelihood was just someone seeing his um, what he bought for fun and for projects um, and you know it came to it's a big part of his livelihood now digitizing physical products is a big part of this so and one of the other ways you can you can make things is if you have something and you can put it in a 3d scanner and you can so a more, more complicated type of part. We're not there yet. We're not but, there but yet. It's, but it's really close. It's, 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 it's mostly been used for novelty right now. So right. so uh, if you watch like the Colbert Report or anything, there was a people were scanning, Col uh, you know, Stephen Colbert's face and making different objects out of his face. Right. So it's been kind of a novelty thing. But what we're hoping is that in the future, when we have scaling properly and everything set up right, we can scan it apart. All of a sudden, you've got dimensions. You've got everything about that physical object and then you can just hit print scan print just like people and share yeah and share right. so does this apply to more than just plastic <clears throat> items right now it's abs plastic and pla which is a corn based plastic um but yeah right now it's it's plastic we've also got the laser centering of the um, um i think shapeways does yeah, the, the laser does, uh, bra uh, bronze, i think and the steel mm -hmm. right. where it's it's got the uh basically metal flakes in a, a plastic uh, base and then that's melted away and brought together. There's also been some, um, um, I think they had it at uh, Maker Faire, where they've done the 3D printing in sugar and... Uh, well, you can, right. And the, cheese. The other thing, to bring, no <laughs> to bring this back to hacker spaces, there are lots of different machines that you can have to achieve different things. So there are, there are laser cutters. We have a giant laser cutter. You can put wood, you can put thin steel, you can put plastic, acrylics, all that kind of stuff in there Meat. and cut out <laughs> objects. So you can make 3D printers <laughs> with your laser cutter and then you could make a repair part for your laser cutter with your 3D printer. There's lots of different machines and the right. thing is this most is people exciting. can't have these in their bedrooms. Right. You can't have this yeah. in your room at your mom's house. Right. You just can't. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Come on. Do it but there now. are a suite of tools. I mean, there's water jet yes. cutters, there's you know, scanners, there's milling machines, right. there's you know, lathes. Mini lathes, mini yeah. mills, all sorts of different equipment. And number one, you can't afford it. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Number two, you probably don't know how to use it, but there's other people right. that do. And as soon as you learn how to use it, you can teach other people how to use it too. Um, so machinery is a is a really big part of this, but also learning special skills is the or, biggest part of it. Or tapping the community for those right, skills. Right, right, right. There's one uh, sort of a chain of uh, hacker spaces, maker spaces called uh, the Tech Shop uh, at techshop.ws. And what Tech Shop does is they have um, membership base, but you can get like a one day membership and you come in and you can take a class on using the machine. They'll do things like Valentine's Day to teach to use the uh, laser uh, cutter. Uh, um, I think they're using an epilogue. They let you design and print on a uh, bar of chocolate a Valentine's card personalized love note. Um, so you do these very simple basic projects, but once you've taken the class and done that, then you can come in and use that machine. You know, it's the, the so you're you're still getting something out of the class, and it's not like you know you can go to to a Votec and um, over several years learn one or two of the machines, but it's only going after a certain applied to a certain job. But with the hackerspace, you go and I want to use that thing. It's neat. <laughs> so you learn it, um, and that are completely would not be generally commercially used by the even the same industry, most or less right. company. Right. One of the things is, is that you can you can join one of these places just because you want to make cool stuff. You can you can join it be, because you want to you know, 
or you want to make things to increase your standard of living, or you can do it because you want to you know, do both, make cool stuff that increases people's standard of living for lots of people and make a living out of it. So there's a there's a scale as to why you want to join. I mean, there are, I think most members are just making doing the projects that they've had that they've always wanted right. to do, you know. And but there's also the opportunity to go right through to the agorist type of. Right. I think right now what we're seeing is what we call like pro makers, which are people who are really into making things and have have been into making things without having the resources to do it, and they already have ideas. They already are excited about this process, so they're going into a space. They're uh, executing the ideas that they've already had. They know what they want to do. And then what we start to see is people who are just vaguely interested in electronics or construction or different types of projects and just kind of want to learn one or two things. And then even below that we have people who are, are kids who are like five years old and want to learn how to solder. Let's make LEDs blink. Or um, let's uh, show someone how to do crafting things. Let's show someone how to sew. Let's show someone how to uh, Cook anything, anything you would want to teach each other, you can do it at Actor Space. Right. Um, so there's these various different levels, and and some are going to support a space more than others. Some are just going to come in and take classes. Some are going to stay and they're going to teach other people, um, and some are just going to pass through. So there's there's a wide range of people that would visit, and we want anyone to visit our Hacker Spaces. You know, I speak for everyone here. We want anyone who's interested in anything to show up at our door <laughs> and hang out and do things and be interested. And get excited. That's in, there'll be something cool to do. Absolutely. In that vein, here's a sign-up sheet. If you feel like signing up, you can put whatever information you want. I've put name, email, phone, interest, and location. Um, and then below this, there's um, flyers about the Global Village construction set. Oh, cool. So yes. you can take oh, yeah. some of those if you want. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Also I'm not passing around my pen, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. There's also a joy in passing, passing on knowledge. I was actually going to pass one can make it later. Yeah, because that's the yeah, way this is the gesture. Just for whatever whoever wants to take this. this okay. Whichever of the organizers. Right. So there's also a, a special joy in passing on knowledge that you've accumulated and passing on to other people. That, you know, people who, who have skills want to pass them on, or at least a, a subset. And, and so there's a joy in doing that. So you get people that have, you know, maybe they're retired, they've got these skills, or they, right. they've been using these skills for their life, and they just want to pass it on to a younger generation. Well, well, the other thing is in the real world, right? You, If you want to teach somebody something, you have to be qualified, you have to have gone through some sort of higher level education. No. I want four-year-olds to teach 14-year-olds, and I want, you know, 70-year-olds to teach 10-year-olds, and I, I mean, I want, I want teenagers to be teaching classes to everybody. I want any anything, if you can talk about something for five minutes, you can teach someone something. If you can, if, if all of a sudden I'll, you know, so I'll ask people, do you think you can teach a class on this? And they say, well, I don't know, I, I don't really have. But that same person an hour ago came up to me and talked to me for 15 minutes really, really fast about something. That person can teach someone something else. So it's a, you know, there's no qualifications for learning, teaching, doing. There, just, just do. And there's an there's an excitement. You learn how to right. do something. You can show it to somebody else, and they go, "That's really cool. How did you do it?" That's that's learning and that's teaching. I'm I'm curious about the. Some folks might call it the supply chain. I prefer to think of it as a nutrient cycle. Um, so, you've mentioned different types of plastic and metal. Yep. And then there's also electrical power coming in yes. and buildings to be in. So I wonder if we were aiming to make some a, a, a closed cycle within yep. New Hampshire, um, what pieces are missing right now? Um, the shop's not solar powered. <laughs> right, okay. so electricity, you read about electricity. Uh, water is water, obviously. Yeah. Basic yeah. utilities that anyone needs, that needs to... Uh, to, to make persistent. Um, knowledge is one thing. It's really important to have an internet connection at a hackerspace. <laughs> People are constantly getting ideas and they need to go find out information. So what, what one thing that might be interesting is to, to try to offload websites that have information about doing things um, into the space. So that might be one important thing, is knowledge. Okay. And not, not everyone is, has it all in their head at all times. 
But um, but yeah, that that is an interesting. What about Fab like, Labs? Metal. Fab Labs are kind of more geared towards that. So he was talking about earlier. Fab Labs an MIT project where they basically drop a trailer in a low income area, and they have um, a shop bot, which is a um, a machine that's kind of like a CNC machine that cuts plywood. So you put a sheet of plywood in, and it's a CNC machine, and it's like a laser cutter or anything else, but it does big pieces of plywood. Um, so they put a shop bot in, they put a laser cutter in, they put um, vinyl cutters and all kinds of other things, and they just drop that into kind of a low-income area. I think they do get electrical power, they do get whatever, but that's a very encapsulated system. Well, I'm interested especially, as well as what you just mentioned, right. the raw materials like the plywood, the plastic, the metal. Right. Um, as far as both thinking about designing things for reuse and recycling, right. and also what's the supply chain right now and how can we localize it? I think uh, recycling and reuse is a really important thing in a hackerspace. One, one thing I do see is we just, you know, in our space we have scrap everywhere. You don't you know, want to throw and, anything away. Right, we don't want to throw anything away, <laughs> but yet at the, something. Right, but then at the same time sometimes people go, oh I have a project so I'm going to go grab, I'm going to go purchase whatever I think that I might need without kind of trying to fit their project to what we have left. So that's almost this whole, it's, a lot of people are doing this outside of their current jobs. So some people are working in spaces where they're working for a living and they're doing it for a living, but a lot of people in our kind of, the, the kind of spaces we're talking about is hobbyists. So you, you are just trying to get enough energy to do the project that you're wanting to do. Uh, doing the kind of permaculture stuff is, is a whole full-time job almost on your project. So it adds like 50% of kind of the mental workload. But if other people can offload that kind of work and, and make it more accessible for people than that, that would be interesting. Yeah, sustainability is important. I mean, you know, from what, you know, there's different ways of doing it. You know, one way is to make it profitable. So you, know, you can go the charitable route, you can get, there's lots of different models by which you can structure these things. You know, one, one is just to make it pay for itself. Um, you know, if people are getting value from it, there should be a, you know, a, an opportunity to bring money into the space and make it a profitable venture. Right. Um, and that makes it d sustainable and therefore makes it dependable, which means that people can have businesses that hang off that and know it's going to be there tomorrow. So, and which is a really important part if you're going to go you know, and, and have dozens of businesses hanging off those spaces. It's got to be there tomorrow and it's got to be available and it's got to be a dependable source. Of so we were talking about Tech Shop earlier. That is a is almost more of a gym membership kind of place. So this is a very commercial industry. It is a gym. It's like going to Best Fitness, except they have laser cutters. Uh, so you pay in a monthly <laughs> fee, and you get access to the tools, and you can also take classes. Some of these others, our space is a nonprofit. So we are just interested in becoming sustainable and then using our income to grow the space. Um, there are other spaces that are for profit, though they're kind of rare. Um, but but yeah, so unless they're a big enterprise like Tech Shop, um, but there's all sorts of different ways of structuring these spaces. Um, some have boards that are very uh, localized power, so only only a few people make the decisions about the space, and then you have other spaces that are wholly democratic, and everyone votes about every change that's going to happen. Uh, that sounds awesome, but <laughs> it's tough. It's really really hard. Uh, we have found that, that uh, kind of being a little bit totalitarian actually helps the space move along and, and, and grow. Um, but there are spaces that, that do successfully have the everybody votes on everything that happens uh, format, but, but it, is, it is hard. We want competing spaces and also Absolutely. you can start your own. I mean, if you can start here and if you get, get a business that relies on these machines, you know, if you're successful, these machines are not accessible for everybody just for the garage, for the odd occasional project, but if you're actually <coughs> making money and you started your business in one of these spaces, then making the leap to buying your own equipment where you've got dedicated time, you don't have to you know, share that, right. that machine time with other people or that equipment with other people, that is accessible after you get like you get to the certain point where you, you've established it. If somebody had a question. Yeah. Christian, right? Yeah, Christian. You're opening one of these up in Concord in July? No, no, we have a space that's uh, opening July 2nd. We've been around for a year, we've moved. So we're having a reopening on July 2nd in Nashua, New Hampshire. And your structure is non-profit? Yes, our structure is non-profit. Um, what's your annual budget, if you can answer that? Uh, uh, growing all the time? <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, it, 
it takes a lot of personal financial output to to make a space like this start and make the leaps that we're making um, a lot of individual people are putting a lot of money up to make it successful um, but the space that we had previous was sustainable um, it's just that we're making a huge leap right now and we expect to be sustainable can you quantify them um the rents a couple grand a month um equipments a lot um so yeah i don't i don't know if i can yeah i have a question for you um are you worried about insurance liability i mean you're using equipment that people can really badly injure right. themselves right right so this is something we spend a lot of time talking about and more and more all the time um <laughs> we have different kinds of insurance uh, we have building insurance, we have property insurance, we also have, uh, we have a board, so we're a non-profit business of New Hampshire, uh, we have a five member board, uh, you know, things that we would look at are umbrella liability for the board members, okay. things like that. Uh, we have everyone come, who comes in sign a waiver and sign um, rules and all that kind of stuff. Uh, waivers don't really mean all that much you can still try to sue someone even if they you know even if you've signed a waiver for them unfortunately um, but yeah insurance and liability is is a concern um, what we're trying to do is more and more spaces like this are happening all across the country uh, a, a few years ago there was almost none now in the whole world there's close to a thousand in the whole world so in this country we probably have I don't know 250 really stable spaces that are actually all over the place um, so one thing we're trying to do is this is becoming more and more common so we should be able to figure out these kinds of issues so we're trying to start organizations that kind of pool the knowledge of figuring these really hard things out like insurance like accounting so if you if you have this real desire to start a space like this and you don't know you have people and you have the desire to do it and maybe you have a location where you could do it what else do you have to do there's so much other hard problems to solve about starting a space like this so, <laughs> kind of yeah but really it's more of a whole support network of uh, organizations that can help spaces like this get started so we're working with a group called the school factory which we're trying to pool resources and knowledge into so that as new spaces start, we've taken the, the things that we've learned and the mistakes that we've made and pushed that into kind of a make a space kit. So what we want is all the information and all the procedures and the charts of accounts for accounting and the insurance and the contacts for insurance to just kind of get pushed down to a group of people and say, go, chew through the stuff. It's going to be a lot of work, but at least you know where to start. Is that available? Right now, um, it? It's not publicly available, but we're we're still working on all okay. of it. It's not it's not somewhere. It, yeah. Once it's public, we're still going to be working on it, and it's sure. still going to be a you know a a, a so working document, time. right? And a living document, yeah. But but um but yeah, it will be soon. So yeah. Uh, with regards to the entire operation, uh, have you had to deal with any government intervention, regulations? Permits, any of that? No, we have not had to. We have not had to deal with any permits uh, or any government interaction at all, really. Okay, so you haven't made any like large enough purchases where you know a homeland security person comes snooping around, going, "What the heck are you doing?" Yeah, no, I think most of the free. things that we're buying are not uncommon for businesses to be purchasing in any commercial area. So uh, supplies, okay. solvents, paints. You know, we're not, you know, we're not buying crazy chemicals or anything like that. Well, they got but, that, um, that plutonium from the uranium for the, or, or from the Libyans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for the yes. Flux capacitor project. But, um, they're trying to go more sustainable and working on the lightning catcher to get that 1.21 gigawatt. I, didn't think you were <laughs> I told you all this in confidence. Well, I thought we were open sourcing the... Uh, all right. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Is there a directory currently? Of so the best spaces? the best resource for finding hackerspaces is hackerspaces.org. Okay. Um, so if you go there, there's a list of everyone who starts a space tries to put put themselves on that. So that's the best resource for uh, for finding them in your local area. There is um, Devin 
if people would shout to Devin, he's making a co-working registry right now. Awesome. Like, he's Andy. been putting it together over the last month, um, and maybe he could talk about it. He's standing right out there, someone could call his name. Uh, this is uh, actually not specifically about hackerspaces, but about 3D printing. Okay. Have you guys seen anything to recycle ABS plastic back into filament? People are working on it. Um, I haven't seen it craftsfully yet, but I think if you did some digging, you would find some people doing it. Um, I bet you that's going to be a major thing. Yeah, I, I know is, a lot of people are going to want to be able to melt it back down. Yeah. Turn it into something they can feed back through the printer. Right. So basically, right, have you seen the 3D printers? Sure. Yeah, so it's a filament and it, it runs back in. So you'd have to have a, a machine that would make that filament and it has to kind of be calibrated and really well put together. So, But I think if you did some digging, you'd see people doing it or try doing it yourself. Yeah, that's what I was going to tell you too. There's a lot of people that are trying to make it themselves now. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it's based on or like how they make it. Um, but I know that the, you know, the information is available. It's just right now for me, it's easier to buy a school. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's ahead. getting there. So it's, it's a, oh, sorry, sorry, I did um, The plastic is actually a filament. It's not. I mean, you described it as a hot glue gun earlier. So well, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a real. It's a long spool. Yeah, it's a spool. Right. So it's like okay. a real wire. It's like a spool of plastic. wire, but just like thicker and it's plastic. It looks like weed whacker. Okay, sure. Exactly, yeah. And it comes in different things. Um, yeah, also in regard to the 3D printers, what's the cost of the input plastic? Like, let's say you were going to make a soap dish, like you mentioned earlier, how much would that cost in plastic? Um, I, I would, less than a few dollars. Like right? Under a dollar. Yeah, I mean, less than like, a it dollar. It depends yeah. on where you're getting your, your filament from, really. Right. right. And you um, can buy special different kinds, so you can buy a nice colored Filament. They like have every color of the rainbow now. You're gonna buy. You're gonna pay more to get color. Glow in the dark. You could, have, the a, dark, you could yeah. have a sparkly <laughs> soup dish. Yeah, you can also yeah. you can also produce like sushi rice. You can put sushi rice through it. You can okay. put food products through it. I mean, you can put. You could do uh, like custards. So there's a whole. There's like a culinary group that does. Uh, they don't use. They don't use the rep wrap. They mm -hmm. use a. Yeah, uh, like a meal. Yeah, they use a different. Uh, fab at home. Yeah, fab at home. Fab, fab at home. home. So like people are making like crazy sushi dishes out of it, and like, and like making really good money. I mean, you, you know, for an event like that, you can make quite a nice uh, business out of like, out of that type of thing. Tell us about the co-working registry. Uh, so, have you guys talked about co-working at all? A no. little bit. So, so co-working co is like a shared office space, uh, like, but there's, there's like a community manager who's kind of the manager of the space. People pay like a monthly fee sometimes, maybe, you know, it's like $20 to kind of like be invited to the parties. You know, it goes up to some locations are up to like six hundred dollars a month for like full time. Yeah, you know, I'd say the average is around if you're not in a big city, uh, you know, one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty dollars a month for like full time membership. And these are really like community office spaces where people really focus on helping members help each other. Uh, some people call co working like the the way hacker spaces like make money. So like co working and hack spaces sometimes have like a relationship or like they're kind of the same space. It's kind of like Hacking is kind of the hobby, and co-working is kind of how people uh, earn a living. But out, out of the co-working community, uh, which is pretty vibrant on like a co-working Google group, uh, the co-working Google group, uh, yeah, they, they have unconferences and stuff. There, there is a, uh, a clear need to have a registry where all the co-working spaces can kind of list themselves. They have a, a visa program where, like, if you are a member of one space, you can go to any other space and uh, spend like up to three days there. But everything's very casual right now, and everything's kind of built on a, uh, a not very good wiki. Uh, so we're <laughs> so we're working. Uh, there's consensus in the co-working community, and they're talking to some people who who do hacks hacker Well, the, the visa program is really interesting. We're really trying to get that started in the hackerspace community. Um, we really want to to be able to if you're if you're traveling and you're a member of a home hacker space and you want to go to another hacker space, you should be able to just kind of like come and go. Um, if you're part of that community, so we really want to see that that, that stuff happen. And then, yeah, yeah and, the, and the, so we're the co-working community, uh, and you guys at Hackspaces.org has a really good semantic media wiki. I think it's semantic, and it's got yeah. you know it's got a list you know it's got listings of lots of spaces. The co-working community has uh, about 500 spaces in its database. The people are projecting internationally there are about 820 spaces uh, now. Combine that with the amount of hack spaces that exist, because they kind of do, they do share a philosophy. Putting all that into a, one big registry to have like about a thousand spaces that it's probably growing 50% a year, uh, and the coworking community is growing 50% a year. I, I assume the maker. So there's someone working on um, out of Hacker Dojo in um, in California, 
they're actually working on some smartphone applications so that you could, wherever you are, you could kind of see the dots on the map yeah. of where, where things are going on, classes, events, and also kind of see where that Visa stuff was happening as well. So yeah, I, combining the list of hacks, we have about the same numbers yeah. of both, and I think relationships have been started with some, but not all. Um, I know we're, we're trying to talk to ABI in Manchester, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't started that relationship yet. But yeah, I think there, there are two, space, two types of spaces that really have a lot in common, um, but are different and are, mm -hmm. are, are for distinctly separate things. And I want to, I wanna, I, it's my personal kind of, maybe not mission, but like, <coughs> I definitely want to lean towards including like the intentional community like world also, because they need a better registry than they have. And like if we could kind of start building bonds between, basically like, I just want to build bonds between like co-working and hack spaces and people who, and make spaces and people who grow food. Because like, then we can really kind of get to a self-sufficient su like network economy that would be, Really awesome. What are you already doing? Where can we find out about it online? So, and we'll be ready? yeah, so coworking, <laughs> coworkingregistry.org right now is kind of a, is like a beta. It's, it's built in Drupal 6. The next yeah. version is Drupal 7, uh, and it's, it's all going to be semantic. We're taking the coworking wiki, which is at wiki.coworking.info right now, and uh, gonna, we're going to convert that into a semantic media wiki. And hopefully, people, some of the people I'm working with who are uh, out of Office Nomads in Seattle, one of the guys he knows Willow and some of the people out there. Willow is amazing. Yeah, so Willow's, Willow's like we're hanging out with her in yeah, California. Yeah, uh, women who are into this stuff are really awesome and like very valuable. Like if you're a girl, yes. I suggest like really making yourself uh, exposing yourself to the co-working and and hack space community, especially the hacker maker space community, because like men will follow you. <laughs> they, will, like, they really will. Like, there, needs, there needs to be more like female energy in this whole thing, uh, especially in like the maker hacker thing. So, uh, but yeah, so coworking registry should be coming out, and like really, it's just an open data project that's going to be as free awesome. as possible. And like, yeah, we, I look forward to yeah. talking yeah. more about this. With you guys offline. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Just contact info about the, the Nashua. And I don't know if it's starting. Yeah, makeitlabs.com. Uh, make talk it. to me afterwards. I'll give okay. you a card and stuff. And and there's a sign up sheet lapse. going around. And yeah, you're on the email that. list. Okay. So one more quick question about the three frames. Do you think sure. that there's going to be a day, and I don't know if it's you know about the plastics or whatnot, but they'll be able to, be able to take plastic bottles, yes, grind them up, yes, melt them down, and make your Absolutely. own. Absolutely. Right. So we are in the homebrew computer club phase right now. <laughs> I, I, I like that. All the questions that they asked about computers were yeses, and they are yeses now, and what you're asking now will be yes. <laughs> food, you will print your food, like he's saying, you will, like, everything, you will shove everything into a thing, and, yeah. and it's things not that, that far you, away. It's really not that far away. Intentional problems, you know, intentional things will come out, purposeful, useful things will come out. Yeah. yeah. Um, Two things. One, uh, people who are interested in 3D printing, yeah. uh, eMaker still has the Indiegogo project right now, 550 okay. for a riprap kit. Yeah. Uh, if you want to pledge, I think there's like two or three days left for that. Is it like a Mendel Prusa or something? Or? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a Huxley. Okay. It's a riprap Huxley. Okay. Uh, so it's small, but it, it's pretty well proven. Uh, the other thing is, is one of the other cool things that are going on in the 3D printer world is using it for medical technology and printing skin grafts. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. So yeah. not only the so. food that you eat, but if you can print out food, you print out some organs too. Yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the scary stuff. <laughs> As long as we can't print out a brain to put in it, I'm okay. <laughs> they already implant, haven't they already implanted a stent printed from one of these? Oh, yeah, I, I would so. imagine, really? yeah. Absolutely. The, the, the higher end commercial versions are, are definitely accurate enough that you could yeah, put there medical was, devices on it. There was a guy who had uh, multiple uh, scans of his heart done huh? and uh, you went on, basically worked with the, the doctor and he was an engineer. And they worked together to create a custom stent for his heart. Um, and then once they knocked out the research, um, they realized this is cheaper and more effective than buying off-the-shelf tech. Um, works better than the balloons, things like that. And like, this is actually easy. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. And now. Of course, it'll be years before uh, yeah. FDA says this life-saving tech can be used, even though this life-saving tech is 
proving that it can be used. Thanks. So you just need a gory <laughs> section of the hacker space for the mm. doctors. Well, oh, there's the biohacker spaces. Um, and yeah, DOI bio communities are are are, prop, are cropping up, and they're really interesting. They scare the crap out of people, who, <laughs> but I think the people in it are really cool. We have lots of people in bioengineering school, right? So our communities have kind of come out of electrical engineers that are in school, and they're hobbyists, and they want to do things, and they don't have access to stuff. There's lots of bioengineering people, and they want to mess around too, so just don't kill us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I won't care when I'm dead, but... <laughs> Any other questions? What What do you guys see as a kind of a like? What are the most uh, productive things people can kind of make in their like? What are, What are the things that that people are making in these spaces that are adding like real value to their lives easily? Uh, We're not co-working spaces. No, I know, but like what, no, like, what type of like you know Android like phone hacking or whatever like are doing like are, are there like you know, people are making rumbas or something like those, like vacuum things. Oh, yeah. Like, is there? Have we? I have mean, we, we have a lot of students. That's happening? We have a lot of students in a lot of these different spaces, and they're like, they're making their thesis is easier. Yeah. Because um, they can all of a sudden pop out something with open source hardware and just and the knowledge of other people around them that they'll just do amazing things. Um, but project hopping is a big deal. I mean, so you've got an idea, you want to show somebody what what your idea is, what it does, right. what it looks like, a physical representation rather than you know, words on a page. That's one one area that you know, Fab Labs in particular are, are being used. Yeah, I think uh, some of that stuff is kind of happening in Fab Labs, where you have them in local communities and all of a sudden people are making like generators yeah. out of with like a laser cutter and a printer and a shop bot, right. you know, like they're making useful things to solve problems. That's the other thing is we, we're so used to so part of what makes hackerspaces interesting is we're really used to not making things. We're really used to not being tactile with our physical world. And we're, part of this is a, is a retraining of how to do that. Like one of my friends, he teaches kids and he teaches adults hack, hacking classes. If you give a kid a Dremel, he will make 15 holes in something. <laughs> if you give an adult a Dremel, he will hold it like this and look at what he's going to drill and not do anything. So we're, we're really trained to not like change our physical world. So part of this, I think, is when you see those Fab Labs get dropped into like, you know, uh, South Africa and stuff, all of a sudden they're like, I've had this problem forever and I've been trying to make this thing. <clears throat> they print something out and all of a sudden it's done. They had a kid who figured out how to make a windmill without Google. Yeah. Like he didn't have the internet like or a library or anything. He made a wind generator by himself. They showed him Google afterwards. He was like, didn't, what have you guys been doing? Isn't he like <laughs> energizing the whole city now too? Yeah, I he'd like he, energize yeah. the whole village. Yeah. Yeah, so I think part of this is a cultural thing. We, 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 are, we are doing silly things now in order to start to retrain ourselves to solve problems later. Uh, at least that's what I'm hoping for. Because well, I'm definitely seeing a lot of impracticality and silliness too. Yeah. Um, and and it's hard to explain to people why this is a useful endeavor, but I think part of this is is de decompartmentalizing ourselves in our daily life because we're so used to going to whatever job we have and letting other people solve those problems instead of solving our task at hand. So. It's about accessibility. It speaks of accessibility, but it's also making it approachable and doable through technology. So. Something that, just like computers used to be, you know, they had a, you know, right, and, right. People were on Apple <laughs> Ones that were just like typing hello onto the screen and playing chess, and they were like, what are you going to use this for, you stupid nerds? Yeah. <laughs> and it was silly, you know, and there weren't many applications, and, and now, it, it, now it's causing uprisings in the Middle East. Like, I mean, and here. another example. Of huh? And here. And here, yeah. Um, a popular project that people build before going on building other things and learn some valuable skills is something called the world's most useless machine. God, kids love that thing. Oh God. Okay, so let's let's explain this. All right. It's, <laughs> sorry, I'm at excited. its most basic. <laughs> really excited. At its most basic, it's a box with a switch. You flip the switch. The box open, the box, uh, 
something comes out. An arm comes out and turns the turns the switch off. Right. That's, and then the lid closes. Uh, that's it. Uh, so it's a box with a switch. You flip the switch on, the lid opens, an arm comes out, turns itself off, the, the arm goes back in and closes itself. But you can sit there for hours. I swear to you. I have put this in front of on at expo tables and I have had seven seven year olds come up to it in a row and just go and it's an amazing thing. Like we had, we were at a robotics expo, and they had things that saved lives, and like went under the sea, and like moved like insects. And I had more kids in that useless box than than looking at anything else. And I was like, clearly, this is gonna save lives. Yes. On interest level alone. But they've developed such a following that now there's world most uh, there's versions of them. There is a, uh, a Japanese hacker that built one. That first one, it's a bit slower. Each time, it gets more impatient uh, about how quickly uh, you're, it flips the switch. After a while, you flip it, and it just goes crazy. Starts spinning around the desk, throwing stuff off of your table, uh, flashing lights. Uh, even more you, useless. Yeah. The best part is yelling at you, and then you try it one more time. It retracts the switch. <laughs> the switch inside. Even in its most basic form, it's persistent. So the best part is, is you you have a child. He starts to learn, right? And it's amazing seeing kids learn, right? They hit a switch and they let go. And the and it turns itself off. And then they hit the switch and it turns itself off. And then they hit the switch and they hold it. And they go, No, you can't turn yourself off. So the arm comes out and goes, Okay, 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 okay. And then they finally let go and it switches itself off. Because it's a really simple circuit and it's just really persistent. And seeing kids like learn that and interact with this thing like it's a live in object is really interesting. So, but anyway. Silly things. We could go on all day, but <laughs> yes, there is a schedule. Um, there, there is this new hacker space in New Hampshire. So if you're if you're here already or you're thinking of, of moving here, there's MakeItLabs.com. It's in Nashua. There'll be a grand reopening, second uh, of July. You can get all the details on the site. We're passing around the sign up sheet. You can get on the mailing list, and you'll get reminded of the uh, grand opening. And then, say your. Uh, Co-working space site again. Uh, CoworkingRegistry.org, but uh, also it's going to be linked out from Coworking.com, which has uh, okay. links to like the Google Group, which I if, like. You know, is really a nice, friendly place where people really share best practices on how to manage coworking spaces. There's a wiki that's going to be transferred, but yeah, Coworking.com, CoworkingRegistry.org. And there's a uh, Hackerspaces.org if you want to find one in your area. If you're not going to be here in New Hampshire. Just ask these guys questions uh, later. We've got uh, two or three other things coming up. and. Uh